So welcome everybody. I'm Peggy Plett, Deputy Chief Executive Officer for Benefits and Services here at CalSTRS. And my partner is... Ed Derman, Deputy Chief Executive Officer for Plan Design and Communication. And we are grateful for your attendance today and appreciate the interest that you show in continuing these meetings as we all are trying to do the right thing for your employees and our members. Um, you've all had a chance to have lunch. You know where the bathrooms are. You know all of those logistics, right? For those of you who are in the building, for those of you in the field, we assume that you're self-contained. <laughs> and that you know how to take care of yourselves. You're all adults. Um, in your packets, you have handouts that include the agenda and include copies of the presentations that you'll see from us this morning, as well as an information circular on what the pension plan limits are for the tax year 2013. And if you have any questions about the uh, information in your packets, you can see one of us at the end of the meeting today. Um, we know that there will be opportunities for questions. If you have a question, I do ask that you raise your hand, wait for the microphone, and identify yourself and your employer, your school district, before you ask your question. That way, if the staff listen in to the tapes later and want to get back to you on something or, or go into detail a little bit more with you, they have a way of identifying you because they might not recognize your voice. Um, and we'll try and address all of your questions during the meeting. If not, we'll make sure that we get back to you. Um, I would like to remind you that at the conclusion of the meeting today, that if you are a CalSTRS member, you can have your parking validated. If you're not a member, you need a credit card in order to pay for parking to get out of the building's parking lot. Um, unless there are any questions, the first item on our agenda today is an opportunity to meet the leadership team for the employer services side. And to kick that introduction session off is Peter Haley, our director for member account services. Good afternoon, everyone. I thought it might be a good opportunity for you to meet the leadership team for member account services. A lot of times you have the opportunity to speak with staff, and sometimes you'll also have the opportunity to speak with their manager or the other leadership members of, of the team. So as I call out their names, I'll have them come on up. They're not too happy about this because it's a surprise, but I figured what the heck. <laughs> First, the assistant director is Michelle Johnson. <laughs> yeah. And then our new member to our team, who is directly over the employer services area, is Andrea Luna. Yeah. Feels like Price is right. <laughs> and then we have Nancy Roberts. And Tammy Sanchez. Suzanne Torres. And Brian is uh, out camping with a bunch of fourth graders today, so he won't be here. <laughs> and then finally, over our outreach and uh, improvement unit is uh, Bill Ferris. Is Bill here? Oh, good. Everyone probably knows Bill. All right, here's the team. Thank you. Their contact information is on the uh, in your handouts, and anytime you have any issues that the representative can assist you with, please feel free to contact the manager. Great, thank you. Okay, so uh, next on the agenda is a state and federal legislation update. Uh, Marianne actually is not available; she's in a meeting in the Capitol, so filling in for her is Joyce Lynn Martinez Wade, also from Governmental Affairs. Good afternoon. So yes, I get to give the legislative update for Marianne. We'll cover various things. Like Ed mentioned, she is at the Capitol right now visiting with a legislator. Um, she has a plan through March so far, and thereafter she's going to visit with 
all 120 assembly members and senators. So we've got about two thirds of those appointments already made, some of them at their district offices in Southern California, most of them up here at the Capitol. But she's going through um, uh, a packet with each one of them, talking about our unfunded situation, talking about what impact CalSTRS makes in their district um, with our members who are there, um, and just generally about CalSTRS. There's a ton of new members um, this year, so they probably aren't as familiar with CalSTRS as some people, so she's going through and educating educating everybody, but she has a busy, busy schedule. <laughs> um, on the legislation front, so far we have introduced is AB 125, so that'll be on your board matrix um, by Assemblymember Wykowski. It's very similar to last year's AB 1735, and it gives our board authority um, over the CFO, Chief Financial Officer, and COO, Chief Operating Officer um, positions so that they can set compensation and the um, provisions of those positions. Um, it, there is a slight change. Last year, the salary was limited based on the governor's salary. This year, it's based on 110% of the maximum salary for a CalSTRS investment director. So just a slight change. Um, we do have plans to have another uh, sponsored bill introduced, and we do have an author. Assemblymember Mullen will be introducing a bill um, by February 22nd, because that's the deadline, but um, on electronic communication authorization. So in our law, it's, it's different from CalPERS, but we can't just um, go and say we want to switch from sending out paper copies to an electronic copy. So this will give us that authorization with appropriate warning to the members um, and with an option for them to still receive a paper copy. But we want to basically have that authorization. So that bill will accomplish that. We don't have a bill number yet. We'll make sure to get back to you with that as soon as possible. Um, we, of course, always have our annual technical housekeeping bill will be coming up. Again, we don't have a uh, bill number yet. It hasn't been introduced, but that will be coming up in the next couple weeks. And you are very familiar with the fact that we'll have a conforming bill for PEPRA. Um, it's with the Ledge Council right now being drafted. I just had an hour conversation with the uh, attorney about the language. Um, and that one will be introduced by the 22nd as well. And I know Danny earlier this morning from CalPERS talked about SB 13, the urgency bill with cleanup to PEPRA, um, and they have amended it and they have addressed some of the issues we talked about at the last meeting. So I'll go through those in just a moment. Any questions on those pieces on our sponsored legislation or session? Anything else? Excellent. Um, probably the most substantive amendment that was made to SB 13 um, was that it includes now an allowance for individuals with concurrent membership um, prior to 2013 that if they do become a CalSTRS member and they perform service under that other system within the six months prior to their membership date here, that they would be considered a 2% at 60 member. So that concurrent membership piece is now in SB 13, and it's retroactive to January 1st, 2013 in the bill. So if that doesn't change, if it gets signed into law, we'll be covered there. Uh, we did also submit to the legislature a definition of a member subject to PEPRA for CalSTRS. It looks like that probably won't make it into the urgency bill. We had thought it might. Um, so that would end up being in our conforming bill so that we have a specific definition of who that member is. And then I, I know Danny mentioned earlier today that there was no new clarification on pensionable compensation. We had also recommended language on that for, the, for SB 13. So we're still hoping, though, that there'll be extra clarification on that, especially around the area of regular recurring pay um, and saying that, you know, for instances of stipends for master's degrees and certificates and longevity, that those are creditable or pensionable compensation. Um, but we... You know, I'm disappointed they weren't included in this round so that we could have that clarification right away, but hopefully in the next round of amendments we'll see that going in. And we also plan to, in our conforming bill, to have um, explicit language in that regard. And we had talked about earlier, so I just want to um, mention it again, but things such as parity, lottery, lottery, and overload payments, which aren't always regular incurring based on the uh, number of students in the teacher's classroom may change and based on whether lottery payments do come through. Um, so those things, we did get feedback from the consultants that they thought those should be creditable, but because they're unique to CalSTRS, those would be in the conforming bill. So stay on the lookout for those things when that gets introduced. Um, and really, that's all I have for SB 13 and on that front. Yes. Um, with the 
CalPERS meeting this morning, um, I asked if they, oh, sorry, yeah, me. yes, Francis Moraz, Alley County Office of Education. Um, we asked, I asked CalPERS this morning if um, they were going to address the compensation cap uh, being fiscal rather than calendar, because I thought that it had been stated in a previous meeting. He, Danny thought it was on the STIR side that they said they would be looking at making it fiscal. Mm -hmm. Is that still being looked at? Yes. yes. And will that be part of 13 or part of the conforming bill? The conforming bill. bill. Okay. Yes. But, uh, is that going to be just our law or, or in the government code? Just our law. Yeah, so it would, that change would only apply to the compensation cap for Cal STIRS members, not for CalPERS members. They need to change it if they want it. They need to change it in their law if they want it to, to be applied that way. That's correct. Any other questions? No? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, Joyce Lynn. So, uh, to give an update on the implementation of, of AB 340 is Bill and Kathy. <coughs> <coughs> I remember how you said Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Bill's making me fly solo on this, so I just want to give you guys an update on AB 340 and where we're at. <clears throat> Last time we talked about what we did in phase one, and just to remind you, so we identified the population in phase one, the 2% at 60 and the 2% at 62 members. Uh, we made changes in the system so that if you set anybody up in the system after on or after 1 1 2013 they defaulted into the two at 62. <clears throat> we made changes into the system so that if you set somebody up again on or after 1 1 2013 you could not backdate that um, you could only go as far back as 1 1 2013. we added an indicator on reap and we added a column on the match file to give you guys information on the retirement formulas and we put in a new edit, the 114 edit that prevents um, the traditional special compensation, the assignment code 57 and 6 for the two at 62 members. So that's what we did with phase one. So I'm going to talk about uh, phase two. It went in on February 1st, and we added two new edits, and we modified one. And I'm going to go over each of those. So the first one is business rule 083. And as you see, the error description is service period invalid or prior account effective date. And this is the one that will prevent reporting lines being reported prior to an effective date. Uh, last time I talked to you guys, I said we had the business rule 007 that did that for member lines. This edit will catch member lines and non-member lines that are reported prior to the member's effective date. We made modifications to business rule 114, and that's the one that is um, going to allow assignment code 72 for 2% at 62 members. Now remember, you're only using that assignment code 72 for 2% at 62 members, and you use a contribution code 6, just like the other special compensation for the 2 at 60 members. Um, I did want to remind everyone what special compensation is for the 2 at 62 members. It's based off the normal monthly rate of pay or the base pay. It has to be paid pursuant to a publicly available pay schedule, and it has to be paid in cash to all persons in the same class of employees. So with that said, we got clarification, and last time we talked, we said things like educational stipends, longevity, we felt could be considered part of the normal monthly rate of pay. Um, so if you want, if you have these, the way to report them is they would have to be part of the normal monthly rate of pay, meaning they would have to be paid monthly in order to be creditable because currently we do not have a definition of base pay in our law. So that it would only meet the criteria if it was on a monthly basis. I know this is new, so if we have questions, we can do this right now. And Ed's going to help me with questions, just in case. <laughs> okay, so if you have a teacher being paid, let's say they earn. Oh, 
I'm sorry. sorry. Francis Moraz, um, LA County Office of Education. So you have a teacher that's being paid three thousand dollars a month, okay. okay? But they have um, an education stipend, special okay. comp, that's let's say a hundred dollars a month. Right. What you want to see reported is thirty-one hundred dollars in earnings with a thirty-one hundred dollar pay rate, or three thousand as a one fifty-seven and a hundred dollars as a seventy-two. <laughs> It's dependent on how it's on, on, if it's built into your your salary range, it would be your first version, the $3,100. But if it's just listed, like a lot of you guys had mentioned, um, on the pay schedule, it might say educational stipend, $2,000, then you can do the, the assignment code 72 accompanying the monthly. It would just be on a monthly basis. You said you could report it? Oh. <coughs> Debbie Ledford from Nevada County. Yes. Okay, you said that you could state it that way, but do we need to state it that way where it's broken out? It's dependent on how it is in your contract. Okay. But if we have it listed on there, say $2,000 longevity, um, you know, and if it says included in, in base salary or whatever, would we still need to break it out or can it be included in that monthly? So it's listed on the bottom and it's not in your step and column? It's not in the step and column, but it says it's included in the base pay. It's included in the base pay. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I think you would use the assignment code 72 if it's okay. listed out there. Really, you would only report salary what's truly salary. So if it's, if it's um, in the pay schedule and like... Mm -hmm you would do retros on it and that kind of thing, then it would be one line. But if it's just an additional amount, then you would use the assignment code 72 with a CC6. Okay. And is that only for the 2% at 62? Correct. Okay, because well, in our county, it's in, we have it on the salary schedule, but we've for years, it's been included into their salary and their rep base. I'm sorry, let me go back. Are you asking, is it only for the 2 at 62 to yes. use... Um, the assignment code 72 or to break it apart? To break it out. So you already put it in the yes. salary. I, if you're already doing that, I think I'm looking at Peter. I think that's fine. You don't okay. have to break it out. But for the new people, 2% 62, we would need to break it out. I might, I might have to get back to you on okay. that one. Um, because you have to treat them like the same. The entire class of employees has to be treated the same. So I think you would have to do it fairly the same. But I'll, I'll let Peter take that. So currently when you give the person a COLA, is it based upon the, the full amount, including the, uh, the stipend, or is it separated out? Is it just like $2,000? And then if you give a person the, the call on top of that, it includes the $2,000 in the base, or is it separate? Some districts do, some don't. I think if it's included, then it could be part of the base. However, if it's truly separate, then you want to have it reported as a separate line. Okay. Hi, Kyle Judson, Chabot Las Positas Community College District. Yes. Um, I've had the same argument with PERS, and the same thing goes with this, um, because a lot of times longevity steps are put in as part of, you know, they're, say, to be included in base salary. Mm -hmm. um, and so why is it, you know, has to be reported as special compensation when it's just 2% on top of whatever you're already getting? And you can easily print a salary schedule that shows an additional step that's 2% more than the previous step. Um, so uh, always my question has been, then why isn't two, step two longevity? Because you get it after so many years of being mm -hmm. here. So, so step one is the base, and then step two is for longevity, and step three is for longevity, and then when you get something that's a 10-year longevity or a 15-year longevity, it's the same thing. It's, it's like an additional step. Mm -hmm. um, what we did with our faculty is they originally had 15 steps. Mm -hmm. And so what we did is we came up with a new salary table that now goes step 16, 17, 18, and 19 are no increase. But step 20 is an increase. Then step 
21, 22, 23, 24 are not increases, but step 25 is an increase. Okay. Those are... And I think that's acceptable. Right. We're, we're just giving um, different avenues. So if people that don't build it into the salary schedule, they still have an yeah. avenue to report it to us. And, and my point is, is whether I say 2% added to the base or whether I print it on a salary schedule, the effect is exactly the same thing. It affects the entire class. It right. is applies to everyone. Right. If it's not visible, and so that's what really the question is. I mean, that's the thing. If you can visibly see it on a printed salary schedule, then it's not special comp. But if it's calculated and added, then it is, even though the effect is exactly the same. OK. <laughs> I, I'm not sure if you're asking me a question or if you're, oh, OK, OK. Is there any other questions, <laughs> statements on this? No, I appreciate it, and I, I, I definitely see what you're saying. Okay, so we're going to move forward. Um, I did want to put a caveat in there that there is, it is our intent to allow edu educational stipends and longevity stipends on an annual basis. Um, we're trying to put it either in the conforming bill or possibly amendments in SB1. Three. However, we must wait for the bill to be law in order to be able to comply with that or to implement that. So right now it has to be paid on a monthly basis in order for it to meet the definition of credible for two at 62. And the last one we did was business rule 115 and that's to uh, the error description assignment code 72 is invalid for members with the 2% at 60 retirement formula. So this is just to prevent the assignment code 72 for being reported for the 2% at 60 members. Just have a couple more slides. Um, phase three will take place in the fiscal year 2013-14. And some of the things we have for phase three are modify so to allow for different employee contribution rates for the two at 62 members. And modify so to monitor the contribution cap and allow for payroll lines with 0% or zero contributions, I'm sorry. Um, in addition with that, uh, that would include a running total of contributions and earnings in REAP on the uh, service credit tab so that it's easier to keep track of where the members are as far as the cap is concerned. And then uh, putting an edit in to um, monitor the amount or kind of limit the amount of special compensation with the assignment code 72. For resources on so we have the FAQs that are out there. Um, the Pension Reform Directive, the Employer Connect Special Edition regarding PensionReform.com. We have a couple things out there, uh, recent pension legislation and the summary of AB 340. And you also have your member account services representatives you can contact. And that's it. So if you guys have questions, I'll take any more questions you guys have. We're good. Thank you. Um, now, Bill, you're not entirely off the hook. Bill Frerichs is going to talk to you about employer training. <laughs> I'm never entirely off the hook. I've, I've learned that over the years. So, um, Okay, I just got a, a quick update on employer training. Uh, employer training was under a different manager, and that's been transitioned to my team. So we're sort of revamping our offerings, and I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that. Um, I'm excited about it. I, I think uh, we're heading in a, a new direction as far as providing a lot of self-help material that you can get to and access quickly and easily. Your districts can access quickly and easily, and that'll be a good starting point. We're still going to do training assessments, and we'll evaluate whether we need to come out and do in-person training. We're still going to do all that, but we wanted to get some information out there that is easy, easily accessible, it's consistent, and uh, helpful more than anything. So we're developing a series of training videos that are about five to 10 minutes each um, in three main sections to start. There's gonna be uh, videos on the Secure Employer website, basically on each section or functionality that is in the Secure Employer website. So like manage files, we're gonna develop a training video that talks about 
how to upload files, how to access information in those files, how to approve edits, how to make online corrections, everything that you can do in Manage Files. And along the, the same lines, we're gonna do that in each category. So manage reports, employer notifications, we're gonna create uh, videos or a series of videos on each one of those topics. And we're gonna post those in reference items in the Secure Employer website, so you can access them there anytime you want, anytime it's needed. Your districts, if they have access to SEW, they can also access that same information. We're also going to be developing videos on penalties and interests, so on all the different penalty types, uh, there's existing videos out there right now about disputes, how to dispute items. I don't know if you're aware of that, but there are three uh, videos out there right now that tell you how you can dispute penalty amounts, and you can get to those today. Um, but they'll be along the same lines as how those videos are laid out. If you've already seen them, they'll be very similar to that, the, the, the rest of the ones that we're developing. And the last uh, section we're gonna develop is on traditional workshop topics. So when we go out and do in-person training, we do like membership, we do creditable compensation, we do community college specific training. We're gonna break each of those out into a separate training video as well and you'll be able to access that information there. So I'm hopeful these are gonna be um, very helpful to you. And I really encourage you to go out and, and look at these when they become available and give us feedback and let us know hey, I think you know this topic isn't covered, that should be covered, or this topic doesn't go into enough detail. We'd love that kind of feedback to make those videos better um, and to get everybody using them. Also, in addition to those videos, uh, we're gonna, I'm gonna start, I shouldn't say we, I'm gonna start presenting uh, a, at each, each employer advisory meeting um, a training topic or a training tip. So it's gonna be a standing agenda item. I'm gonna get up here and talk about some hot training topic that you know, that I think needs to be communicated out or there's some tool available that isn't used very much. So every EAC, there's gonna be a standing agenda item for me to go over some training tip. Um, and what else? <laughs> oh, also in the Secure Employer website, we're gonna be posting a bi-weekly training tip on the announcements page. Similar to what I'll do in EAC, but every couple of weeks we're going to put something new up there that says, hey, go check this reference item out. It tells you how to do annotations. Go check this feature out of the website. Go look at this. Go look at that. So keep posted to the, uh, to the announcement page to see any new training tips out there. And I think that's about it. So again, we'd appreciate any feedback you guys can give us on those videos and those training tips that we're going to be posting. And if there's any topics you'd like to see us cover, we can certainly... Uh, address those. Any questions for me? Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, Phil. Next on the agenda is a presentation from Phil Burkholder on Gatsby, but he's not in the room right now, so I'm going to pull Renee Yurita in ahead and have her talk about employer reporting full enforcement. <laughs> Do I need to skip through slides or? Oh, it's already here. OK. Good afternoon, everyone. That full enforcement was over, but it's not. We're back. Um, full enforcement continued, as I like to call it. So all the counties were fully enforced for categories 1 through 12 um, as of July 1st, 2012. And that was uh, in preparation for penalties and interest. Um, during PERC, the Penalties and Interest Regulations and Compliance Project, we were able to make adjustments and modifications to a number of business rules. Um, those business rules were the ones that we were able to throw into categories 1 through 12 and go ahead and enforce you for so that we knew everything was working well. Um, there were seven remaining business edits. Um, those seven, we weren't confident or 100% sure they, that they worked well, so we wanted to take a little bit more time to test and do some analysis to make sure they were working. And so those seven are the full enforcement continued group, and that will be in category 13. So the seven remaining edits are uh, edit 51, pay code altered. Uh, you, most of you should be familiar with these. Um, edit 60, negative adjustment received subsequent to a refund or death. Um, the first one, 51, is not employer approvable, but the, ones, the 60 is employer approvable. 
Um, edit 62, adjustment results in negative earnings, contributions, or service credit balance for the service period range, not employer approvable. Edit 63, negative adjustment received subsequent to Kelster's benefit effective date that is employer approvable. Edit 65, um, year-to-date service credit excessive, that one is employer approvable. Edit 67, pay rate adjustment alters earn-to-earnable ratio for the service period range, not employer approvable, and one that a lot of you are probably familiar with, Edit 103, service credit is excessive for the service period range as well, employer approvable. So two things I do want to mention about the, this, the edits on this page. Um, edit 60 and edit 63 previously were not employer approvable. We have made changes, and those currently are employer approvable now. Um, the other one is edit 67, which um, is currently approvable. But as of um, August 1st, that one will no longer be approvable. Let me get into the next slide, and then I'll talk about that. OK, so common error triggers for edit 60 and 63. Um, negative adjustment receives subsequent to refund or death or subsequent adjustments um, for CalSTRS benefit effective date. So every time you get a negative adjustment, when you um, submit a negative adjustment for the, either of these two types of accounts, um, basically with these two edits, you'll always get these. It's not a sometimes. Um, since the accounts are in the statuses that I mentioned, it's kind of like the accounts closed. Um, and because of that, any type of negative adjustment you make most likely will result in a receivable. Um, so we kind of do it as a double check. We want you to make sure that you are looking at that negative adjustment and that you are absolutely sure that this is the adjustment you should be making on this account. Um, the system will throw the edits and possibly along with some other edits as well. Um, once you verify and approve the 60 and 63, then the other additional edits for that line um, will pop most likely go away. Um, and I do want to again mention that these two edits are employer approvable. OK, edit 65 and 103. Year to date service credit excessive, and your service credit is excessive for service period range. Um, some of the situations where you would see a 65 or a 103 thrown is when you're reporting summer school. Oftentimes, someone will report that they made $8,000 in summer school, and they'll also include that as the earnable, so they'd get a year of service credit for the first two months in, in July and August. Um, so that's a lot of times where we'll see an issue. It's just miscalculation or understanding that the earnable is um, based on the full-time salary and not just for the service, career, service for the summer school. Um, Let's see, partial service reported. Sometimes um, partial service, we see it reported as days and weeks. Let me see. Sorry. We see the um, service reported in days of, or weeks instead of a full service period month, the first through the 30th or first through 31st. Um, because of this, uh, the service credit is prorated, and the system will look at it and flag it because it looks like it could be excessive at times. So again, it's just one of those double checks. The service credit most oftentimes is absolutely correct, and the reporting is correct. Again, it's just a flag in our system that says, please double check that this was reported correctly. And another example would be multiple lines reported for a member with the same service period. Um, when multiple lines are reported, different assignments, part-time assignments, in addition to a full-time assignment, easily can throw over the service credit to the, for the tolerance that we have set. And just because of this, another double check, please make sure that the service credit isn't excessive by accident. Um, let's see. So we know for that uh, edit 103, that there are high vol volumes of Edit 103s. <laughs> we, we know that you see these a lot. We do. Um, we hear from our employer services representatives that, that you guys have questions or concerns about these. Um, because the 103 is set at a tolerance of um, two years for community colleges and 1.5 years of service credit for K-8, or I'm sorry, K-12, we do um, have an analysis undergoing right now so that we can figure out whether or not we need to raise the tolerance. Um, sometimes we see a lot of them just slightly over, so it may be that we need to move it slightly over or figure out exactly why it's going over. So don't be alarmed yet. Um, we, we do want to do a little bit more analysis before we uh, make any changes to those edits. And edit 67. So pay rate adjustment alters earn to earnable ratio for the service period range. This edit is specifically related to the retroactive pay rate adjustments, contribution code 5. Um, 
the, we see this edit a lot with miscalculations. Um, we see it sometimes when, when the retro isn't coded properly, and more oftentimes we see it when the retro is reported for a line that was already previously reported. Um, most of the times during our analysis, we were able to see that these retros were, as I said, uh, miscalculated. So the number of times or the percentage of, of times where it was incorrect versus it wasn't working properly, we were able to determine that it is now working properly after the testing that we've done, after the analysis. Therefore, if we, um, we needed to change it and make it to be no longer employer approvable, because at this point we feel that most of the times that it's correct, um, it's correct coming in if the calculations are right. And we definitely don't want to let um, approvables uh, on this line if the calculation is incorrect. Does this answer the question about the employer approvable? Yes, okay. Um, so I do wanna mention that section 1.4 of the 146 page F496 file specification document um, that's online on SO, um, it does have a section in regard to reversal and adjustment guidelines. We know that this is a, um, a rough subject sometimes, so um, the changes that, I'm not sorry, not changes, the. Um, a little bit more like reference items that we want to provide for you will be coming soon. Um, we do plan on putting a retro guide out there, retroactive adjustment guide. And as Bill mentioned, he may want to add retros to the first training item he does at the next EAC. We'll see what's in popular demand at that time. So full enforcement, um, where we want all employers to be fully enforced by August 1st, 2013. Um, this will give us a little bit less than six months to prepare um, if you feel you've, you're already ready, your numbers and your volumes of the edits that I mentioned already are pretty low, then you definitely have the option, like we did with P&I, to go ahead and let us know I'm ready to be enforced for that. That way you're able to see what the numbers look like in your edit exceptions um, prior to August 1st. Um, our reporting outreach and improvement team will definitely be available, and we will be reaching out to those that are high-risk employers or high-risk with um, higher volumes of these edits. Um, but we definitely want you to feel free to call us, contact us. My email address, ryuri.kelsters.com, myself, Renee. Um, you can call me as well if you have any questions or if you feel like you need some uh, business readiness on this topic. Does anyone have any questions? Sharon from the Sonoma County Office of Ed. Uh, I, I, was, I told some districts I would bring this question up. Uh, it turns out that several of our large districts have given back furlough days in the middle of the school year. The way they set it up in our system has caused all of the lines to be backed out at the, from the old rate, put in in the new rate, but coded as a three for arrears. Mm -hmm. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to cause P&I. The first question I have is, if this is something that was a, a, a written agreement, a bargained thing from the district, is this something that could be successively disputed? And if that's the case, and you guys say, yes, we can um, give back the P&I on that, is that going to be something where we are going to be required to take out all of those lines and re-report them as a five? So as far as penalties and interest is concerned with the, the adjustment code three, um, we do know that with a, a CC code three versus a five, the fives are the ones that we know are, because of bargaining um, reasons, can be exempt from penalties. Um, if you report it with a three, that may not be the case, and it may be necessary to report additional documentation. I'd have to verify that first with accounting before I actually say that that would be the case. Right, because they'd have documentation showing they've approved this right. whole I mean, truly, it's a retro. I mean, I want to say that it, it seems like something that would be... Um, disputable? Yes, disputable. Thank you. Um, but I know that uh, Bill was working with a case similar to yours, um, so we probably, I think he already noted it, to talk to accounting, and he's going to be working with them. And then if I have your name and your county, we can probably get back to you. Or now. <laughs> yeah, that would be a disputable item. I mean, what we did with p and is we knew... Contribution Code of Fives met the criteria of an adjust, or a retroactive pay rate adjustment, so we automatically exempted those. But we do know that there are other instances where you could reverse and replace with a, with a three. It doesn't mean you're, you should get penalized for it. It's just a different way of reporting that adjustment. So even though it's a different way, um, it's still, per the regulations, a disputable item or something that's exempt from penalty. And if you disputed it, it would get approved. Okay, so if we were successful in disputing that, would that require us to 
fix the reporting and change them to fives? Because we're talking hundreds of lines. No, no there's no reason to, to reverse those out and replace them with fives. Perfect answer. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Statements? Comments? Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Renee. Um, so, Phil. I saw your, your smiling face in the room, and I'm sure that everyone wants to hear your update on GASB. So after a little vacation from you guys, I'm back to, to brighten your days with GASB. Um, just as a reminder, GASB 67 and 68 came out last year. Um, it's going to require, at least as it currently sits, that our net pension liability, that's um, the unfunded piece, be on somebody's financial statements. Um, currently, the way it sits, or the intent in the, uh, the requirements were that the districts would have that liability on their financial statements. We're still not sure whether that's really the case, because the state is the sponsor. In our mind, it seems that the state should be the ones with, with this particular liability on their financial statements. But, so that's still unresolved. But it just, this particular statement is coming, coming around. We have to have it in place by the end of next year, in next fiscal year. Districts, if they have to have this um, liability on their books, will have to have it for 14, fiscal year 14-15. So there's some major work that has to happen. Um, currently, what's happening is GASB is putting out their, or building their implementation guide. So they're coming up with questions and answers to publish and tell folks, speci answer specific questions um, right away on how to disclose things on their, on their financial statements associated with these particular um, statements. So we're actively involved with them. We've got uh, GASB 67 is first. We're actually working with them that we submitted a bunch of questions to them. GASB 68 is coming next. Um, and so if I'm going to throw this out there. This is, I'm going to ask you twice. So this is the first time is, if you have any questions um, that you think would be helpful to have answered by GASB, and I don't know that you guys are necessarily the audience, but if you're financial reporting folks, you know, if, if they have questions that they want answered, please have them sent to us, because we can give them to GASB and they can make sure they're in, in the implementation guide. We start a conversation with the Department of Education to kind of do, do the same outreach with them. and. Uh, we just we need to get the word out that this is coming. Um, so, as I mentioned, we've been meeting. We actually met with Gatsby a couple weeks ago on the phone. Had a bunch of questions. We talked it through with them. Um, didn't really get the answers we were hoping to get. Um, a couple of the questions we really wanted, which you know, whose liability really should this be? Their answer was, it's in the statement. So we're not going to get any additional guidance on that question from them. That'll be something we'll have to work out in our own government. Um, but there's still an opportunity to get other questions answered. Um, the one thing that the, the proportionate share concept, and I think I've shared that with you before, that each district would get a proportionate share if it went down to the districts. We had a conversation with our auditors today. And the AICPA is working out what they would like to see in order to have your districts be able to, your district's auditors to be comfortable with the numbers we provide them, which it sounds like it's going to be a lot of work. <laughs> sounds like it's going to be a lot of work on our end, and it's going to extend out to the districts too. Um, there's nothing in stone yet. They haven't made any decisions. And, and AICPA is not necessarily a, uh, it's not a rule setting board like GASB but it's what tells the auditors what they need to look for when they go in. So we're trying to head off the question of having 1,600 plus auditors coming and asking us, how did you get this number that you're giving this district? So that's one of the issues that we're trying to deal with. And so it'll be a lot of fun over the next six months or so to kind of get that worked out. You may hear from us, um, you may hear from the Department of Education. We just don't know where it's going yet, but that's really where we're going. The communication effort is what's gonna start now. Um, we need to get as much outreach as we can. Um, at the CAC, it was last week, two weeks ago. I lost track of the days. Sorry, guys. Um, it was last week. Thank you. <laughs> the, um, we had asked that group 
if you have suggestions on how best for us to get the word out, what groups we need to talk to, what conferences we need to attend, please let us know. Because the, the, you know, what we've been hearing back is the word's really not getting out, which tells us that our, the, the current uh, communication channels we're using just isn't effective. So please help us out and let us know what it, who we need to talk to. Um, we, can get, we can know what to tell you. We just don't know necessarily who to tell so it gets to the right folks, to the decision makers, so they can bring visibility of this to uh, all the governing bodies. Um, that's all I got. Any questions? I scared you guys all into silence. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Oh, wait a second. We do have a question. Um, my name is Kelly Busey with Napa County Off of Office of Education. I'm sure that you've probably already heard this, but I want to make sure that you're hearing it again, that uh, the concern that we have with showing that liability on our books and who owns that liability really hurts a district's ability to go out and get trans and cops in their rating because it's an additional obligation that they have on their books and that'll be in their audit report that are reviewed by all of those rating agencies. So I am hoping, and I'm sure it is, that it's a part of your conversation and that you're reaching out to um, the Basque group that has our CBOs from all of the county offices and one of their roles is really to take that into discussion. And I'll make notes as I can. Actually, I, I did get that suggestion at the last, at the CAC, but it's, again, it's, it, please t share with us anything you think would be helpful. So, and, I, and I'll tell you, when our discussion with our auditors, they brought that exact thing up that they understand what this liability will mean on the district's financial statements. There's nothing they can do about it because it's, now it's gap, it's required, but it, they, they clearly get it. Okay, thank you very much. So next up on our agenda. Thanks, Phil. Next up on our agenda um, is a fun show and tell for us, but it's going to take a few minutes for us to set up the technology to do it. So why don't we all take a stretch break? This is literally going to take probably two minutes to do, so um, don't plan on being away for more than three to five minutes. And while we get the, the technology switched around, um, feel free to stand up and stretch and get your blood flowing. We also noticed that uh, what the, from some of the feedback that we heard that when members went to the previous website a lot of times or visitors in general a lot of times they would feel overwhelmed by information um, they were confused on exactly where to go to find the information and the search tool also um, wasn't as robust as what it needed to be in terms of delivering um, consistent results and actually results of what they're looking for so uh, as part of the business plan uh, we identified the need to redesign the website but it also just so happened to coincide with Calster's 100 year anniversary which which is in 2013. So uh, we started this project, um, the CalSTRS internal team, along with an external vendor in July of last year, and we accomplished it in just around six months, which is a, a pretty monumental task given the previous website. I don't know if you know this, not many people do, but it had around 1,000 pages of information in PDFs. It was huge. So we've now narrowed that down to about 400, which is still a, a huge website. Uh, but we took that opportunity to go through and um, really scour the the data and, and cleanse the website to make sure that uh, everything was correct. And, and we're still doing that on a regular basis. Um, but again, the whole purpose of it was to make sure that we had the most um, uh, current design tools and web technology in place um, to ensure the, both the security of the website, but also our ability to regularly update the content information um, on a moment's notice. So uh, last week, um, I gave this demo to the uh, Teachers Retirement Board as well as the um, Client Advisory Committee, so they both both of those um, groups saw it, and and they uh, they definitely liked it. And we have we have received feedback on the website because it is quite a departure from the previous site. Um, but one of the main things that we noted again. The previous website was very information heavy. So we're trying to make this website more of a navigation portal, if you will, to take you where you want to go and really deliver effective and, and reliable information right when you first get there. Because you know we're all web surfers. We all know how it is. You go to a website, you get very frustrated if you can't find something within the, the first couple of clicks. So that's really what we were trying to do with this and organize information into logical subsets and different buckets, if you will. So what I'm going to do is, um, and again, I should mention, we used a lot of um, data analysis in order
order to formulate the site. So we can tell based on uh, site usage and traffic that a lot of our visitors are members. Uh, the way we're telling that is because the most visited pages are typically calculators, member benefit information. So we're just, you know, we're assuming that, but I think it's a pretty safe assumption. Um, we also see a lot of visits from employers. We see visits from business partners, uh, investment partners, uh, definitely the media. The media is paying attention to the website as well. So um, taking in all of the um, different audience groups who are visiting us, we tried to customize the website to meet all of those needs. So what I want to point out first and foremost is we do have a video tour link of the website that's on every single page that you go to. It'll always be up at the top. I would encourage you to, to take a look at it. My staff did a tremendous job uh, putting that together. I'm going to give you a personal tour, so I'm, I'm kind of like your own little cruise director <laughs> showing you around. But if, you, if you'd like to have a refresher uh, on the various areas of the website, I, I'd encourage you to watch that video as well. Um, this background image. Oh, my mouse decided to, oh, there it goes. Uh, this background image is modifiable. So um, what we're looking at doing, we have several different options in the mix. So we'll be changing that background image uh, to represent different um, subsets of our, our audience demographics um, that we reach. The other thing um, that I want to make note of is, again, as I mentioned, the website is definitely a navigation portal. So when you first go uh, to the site, you'll notice this quick links bar. This quick links bar, the, the tabs that we chose to include were identified based on the web traffic, the most visited pages on calsters.com. So my calsters, that's, that's a huge tool for our members. We want them to be able to use it and, and to effectively use it. So we've included links to my calsters in several different spots on the website. It's here in the quick links. It's also under the I would like to navigation portal, which this, this is a great tool for us because as, um, the season changes throughout the year, we can actually make adjustments based on what our contact center is telling us are the most frequently asked questions or most requested items. And we can make uh, changes to this in real time to have the information updated. Same with, with these. Um, with these tabs, we can change any of those. For example, if uh, retirement workshops seem to be um, a real predominant event that our members are asking about, we could perhaps change one of these to say workshops, and then it'll have the link to the information. So the site has been organized into seven key areas. Uh, we have the members, and again, this is what I was referring to that are the buckets. So we have the members bucket, employers, investments, corporate governance, the newsroom, plan funding and about us. So I'll go into a couple of those different areas. But when you click on members, for example, the site then pulls down into a very uh, content rich um, section that includes applicable information for that particular information area. So uh, members, when they go to, for example, define benefit program, when they click on this within that drawer, they'll get all the information. These are also links that they can go to to uh, learn about the two benefit structures as a result of the AB 340 passage. Um, these links on this side, these are all customizable by my staff as well. So for example, you'll see right now we have 1099R because it's tax season, but we could change this uh, after tax season to perhaps reflect upcoming retirement workshops in your area. So these are all customizable based on what we're identifying are the most, like I said, the most requested needs that are coming up from our, our members most especially, but also site visitors as we receive that feedback. Um, I also want to demonstrate the improved search tool. So the search bar is on every page. So say I want to search for, I have to reach over here without my mouse falling, there we go. Say I want to search for pay dates. Okay, so I just typed in pay dates. It's going through its search process. So it's, it's going to deliver the results, but, but say, for example, this wasn't the exact page I was looking for. But I knew that something I had read ran in 2010 regarding pay dates. This is a huge improvement over the previous um, site. This is actually an, an archived um, search library. So it's, it's scouring the website for any time pay and dates have been mentioned in the same article or the same page. And then it's going to categorize it under, so here's the, for example, in 2010, we ran this article on the 2009 benefit, the December 2009 benefit checks. 
but we also have it under different, it's, it's showing where it's actually appearing on the website. So this is, this is really great, and we've heard a lot of positive comments on the enhanced search feature. Uh, we actually tried it out a couple of times in the Client Advisory Committee, um, just for fun, you know, we were looking at different, uh, where we'd find different publications, but in case it wasn't apparent that it would be under publications, we just searched for the name under the search bar, and they came up right away um, where they are. So uh, it worked really well. So a couple of the other tools I wanted to show you, um, under About Us is where you'll find information on the Teachers Retirement Board. So if you ever have any questions on uh, the board or the agendas or if you need meeting minutes, um, the video archive, all of that is under the About Us tab. So here's the, the video archive. The videos are actually archived on the site back to 2010, but if you need something previous um, to that, say from 2007, we can get that for you. You just have to submit a, a request. Oops. You just have to submit a request for it. Um, the other areas, I want to show you the, the forms tab. Now, if I click on this tab, I've already opened it just for ease of showing you. When I click on the forms tab, this is really popular with our members because um, we do get a lot of requests um, for electronic forms um, delivered to them. So we've encapsulated the forms area into the new website. So I can click on, say I want to order an address change request. Now, here's one thing where we would always encourage our members to register on MyCalsters to submit their address change request, but say they haven't done that yet. You know, They can go to this website and they can click on ordering one quantity of address change form. And then when they click on next, it'll take them to a page where they can submit all of their information and then the form will be mailed to them. So, but again, we always encourage them to do this through MyCalsters whenever possible. Uh, let's see, I do wanna show you the employers tab as well. Let me go back to this. So the employers tab, this is the link to the secure employer website. So when you need to get to that, we've made it a real prominent area. We also have the various circulars that are published that are, that are handy for you to be able to um, access as well as the directives. And then uh, again, the link to the secure employer website. And like I was mentioning before, all of the different drawers or buckets are, are populated with, with really content rich information. So I'd, I'd encourage you to, to explore that further. I do want to point out as well, as I mentioned, this is our, our 100th anniversary. So we have under About Us, we have a 100 year anniversary page. Uh, we are doing um, several different activities throughout the year to commemorate the 100 year anniversary, the, the website being one of them. You probably saw the banners in the back of the room and then we also have um, little flags on the approach to the building as well. Um, but this is really great too. We, we've been soliciting our members and, and just different people throughout the state to submit their favorite stories about their teachers or even photos of their favorite teachers. And that's where we have them under the photo gallery. But we also have a, a video gallery. This is actually uh, Rebecca Milwaukee, who is uh, the National Teacher of the Year out of Burbank. Um, so she's featured, uh, but we also have uh, videos from our board members, from our CEO, Jack Enos, uh, from Dana Dillon. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really nice to see everyone coming together to tell stories about either about their favorite teacher or about their favorite teaching experience. So we're excited about that. Now, the other thing I wanted to show you is the um, CalstersBenefits.S is a website we've been using for quite some time, actually probably about the past three years, to talk about plan funding issues. And as you know, with Senate Concurrent Resolution 105, uh, the plan funding um, situation is really at the top of everyone's minds and what's going to happen. So what we did is, is CalstersBenefits.S was a completely separate website. It looked completely different from Calsters.com previously. So what we decided to do is to envelop all of that information under the primary Calsters.com um, because the previous site was very duplicative in terms of a lot of the information. It had uh, links to the uh, member benefit information. It had um, the fact center, which it still does have, but it was really trying to provide education on the member side, the benefit side, as well as on the plan funding side. But now we've, we've just focused it on plan funding, and then obviously the members have the portal to their member benefits through calsters.com. So when you enter calstersbenefits.us, that URL, it takes you to this particular page on the site. But we also have all of the information housed under the plan funding drawer, 
if you will. So all of the information that was on the previous benefits.us site is within this area of calsters.com. So we still have Ask Jack, which is where our members or interested parties can submit questions to the CEO and, and they'll get an answer. We also have the fact center, you know, making sure that, uh, that the facts they are getting are the, the correct ones. People can sign up for the Outlook e-newsletter, which we send out about twice a month. And then we have the CEO blog on the plan perspective, as well as a couple of different items of interest on the cost of waiting, as well as an overview of the funding situation. So, um, so that's the, the website at a glance. Um, I do want to thank all of my staff. We, we, it's, it was a huge effort, but it was my communication staff. And I have Chad Christman here in the office. He's our multimedia manager. And uh, we also worked with our project management office, our information technology team, our research and development team. They helped us go through all of the pages uh, with all of the content information. And then we used an external vendor here, actually here in Sacramento, called Digital Deployment um, to create the site and to work with our graphic designers on selecting a lot of the graphics and everything for it. So it was definitely a, um, a group effort. And I do want to mention one other thing. This, this website, this version is mobile friendly. So if you went from a smartphone to the website, you'd be able to display everything, but you will need to you know, do the, if you have an iPhone, for example, do the pinch and the zoom, you know, in order to, to see a lot of the different pieces. But what we are working on right now is a mobile version of the site. So it's not a, it's not an app per se, but it takes on a lot of the features of an app, um, but it will work across all platforms. Because when you say, I've learned so much about this in the past like two months, but when you say mobile app, that typically means that it's, it's a natively developed app specifically for iPhone or specifically for Android, and then users need to go to an app store in order to download it. But this way, you don't need to go to an app store. If, if I'm on my mobile phone and I go to calsters.com, it'll give me a, um, an option to add this to my home screen. So I don't know if, you, if any of you have an iPhone, you probably know what I'm talking about. And then it, it adds a little, it looks like an app, but it adds a little bookmark to the site, and then it's completely displayed so it's, it's mobily compatible. So um, it's, you don't have to pinch and zoom. Everything is, is organized in a way so that it's, it's most optimized for the device that you're coming from. So we're excited to be working on that, and I anticipate that'll be launched probably in April or May of this year. We're still working on that. So. But any questions on the site or any feedback? Gretchen, could you show them how to get to um, the advisory committee page under About Us? This mouse doesn't work that well. Okay, and then it's under, right here under people at Calsters under advisory committees. And then we have the employer advisory committee. Sorry, this mouse isn't. So it has the meeting schedule. It also has the meeting materials, the agenda. And I believe we have the, um, don't we have the videos archived on here, Chad? Yeah, right here, meeting archives. And this is where you can access the live video stream as well. But, but say that wasn't apparent to you. So let's, let's just do, just for fun, let's have some fun with this. And hopefully it'll work. <laughs> Oops. Sorry, this mouse is just trying to escape. There we go. Oops. So of course it clicked again. So let's try out the search put tool. Paper, What's that? Put putting, putting the mouse on the paper instead of the... Oh, okay, on, instead of on the rough. There we go. Okay, so let's do employer. Okay, so if we just enter the search term. Oh yeah, that works much better. Okay, and so it brought up the the January meeting. Um, so if I clicked on this, it would take me to the the should take me to that particular page. So this just shows you the. Um, the information. So the, again, this is under meeting archives. So the site will always show you exactly where this is posted on the site um, in case you have any questions. But just to give you an example, that's how the search tool works. And then it delivers the, um, the results. But like Ed said, if you want to find it easily, it's under about us and then under advisory committees. And there's both the EAC and the CAC are in the same spot. Chad, do you know if there's a way to I myself haven't been on the SO website, so I don't. Hold on, hold on a second. We need a mic. And you're asking if there's a way to get to calsters.com or to the EAC portion? 
Dad, hold on. Um, I, I would think I would think there is. I'm not familiar with the contents of the of the secure site beyond the the secure login, but I, I'm fairly certain there's a link in there somewhere that's got to land you back on the Calster's homepage. Yeah. And if not, we can talk to member account services and see if there's a way that we can add that to it so then it's a seamless link to it. Right. We'll send out a notice to the employer community to let you know if it's, if it's accessible from the Secure Employer website. We know, it's, we know SCW is accessible from this site, but we want to make sure that that's, there's that reciprocal arrangement. So your, your, your point is not a lost one on us. Any other questions? Good. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Krista. So I think that completes our agenda. So I'll open up to any other questions or any other things that you wish to discuss. Any other burning issues? Anything out in the field? Carmen? Nope. Nobody has any other issues? Okay. So then the agenda for May 8th, any other than the usual things that we normally talk about, uh, legislative updates, uh, training tip for, for, with Bill, um, pension reform implementation. Uh, you want to hear from Phil again on Gatsby, or are you sufficiently depressed now? We can get, we'll give an update on We can include an update on that. Is there anything else in particular, though, you want to make sure we include? Hold on. The employment of retirees and reporting um, compensation paid to retirees, especially as independent contractors and employer employees of third-party providers, because districts are having a real hard time with that. Okay. Anything else? If not, then I guess we are adjourned. <laughs>